Man, I am here to introduce my wife. Um, looking at Facebook, I don't look at it that much. Just kind of scrolling through some of the Mother's Day pictures. I had a young man, he was probably being comical, uh, but, but his question he posed out was, uh, why do men have to uh, take care of their wives, uh, do special things on Mother's Day when that's not their mother? Amen. It's kind of being funny, I guess. Looking for a reaction. And I begin to think about that. Um, truly, I thank God for my mother, um, everything that she has done for me, uh, all of her rearing, teaching me how to sew, cook, so on and so forth. Uh, but I do understand that when I got married, my mother passed the baton, and she gave it to my wife. And in order for me to be the man that I am today, I had to have this woman in my life. And so how I answer that is, is that, uh, if it had not been for her, amen, my shield, amen, my protector, amen, stand up for me some of the times when I didn't even want to stand up for myself, um, a praying woman when I didn't feel like praying, a preaching woman when I couldn't get inspired to preach, a woman that loves our children. My patience is very thin when it comes to children and teenagers. Hallelujah. I'm old school. You don't like it, move. <laughs> Amen. Thank the Lord for my wife because we would be, we would have an empty house right now, praise the Lord. But I love this lady. Um, what a lot of people don't know is that God has given her a tremendous gift. I know it because she preaches to me all the time. Amen. She prays all the time, and uh, I always tell her, I said, baby, I think you got me on preaching. I, I just really think you got me praying, and, and it's because God has done some miraculous things in her life. And uh, I'm blessed to be her husband, to stand by her side, and to uh, be in the same room with her. She makes me look good. Amen. Amen. Y'all know she look better than me. Y'all better stop playing. But... It, Love this lady on today, amen, and I just ask that you pray for her, amen, and uh, as she comes, and uh, I hope I did good, and maybe she made me a coconut cream pie, or do something, you know, y'all know I'm a fool, Lord is good, but I want to introduce my wife on this morning, Joy Cofield, we just ask that you pray for her as she comes, and as she shares the uh, word of God, amen. Amen, amen, God bless you. God bless you. Thank you so much for that um, wonderful introduction. I appreciate that, honey. You might not get a coconut cream pie because I hadn't told you, but we're going to go on a fast. <laughs> so we might get a salad or something, but it's okay, right? You, you still with me? Still with me. Amen. 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 Everybody give your Lord a hand clap on this morning. Amen, amen. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you, God, for who you are, Lord. We thank you for this day, for this is the day that the Lord has made, and I will rejoice and be glad in it. God, it is because of you and you alone. It's because of you, your love, your power, your might, your endurance that you give us, God, that we can stand here on today. So today, God, we honor our mothers, but more than that, God, we honor you. We honor your presence in this room, God, and we say thank you. Thank you for who you are, God. Thank you for seeing the best in us when we didn't even see ourselves, God. Lord, I thank you for having others to draw those things out of us, God, that we didn't see. I thank you for that, God. So we praise you right now. Lord, I pray that something, God, that has already been said, that will be said, God, is, is a blessing to someone on this morning, God. Lord, I pray that um, I, joy, decreases, God, so that you may increase, God, and that the word of God can be um, shared on this morning. Lord, we give you glory, praise, and honor. Amen. Amen. That would be okay if it was for me, but y'all, we talking about God up in here. Amen. Amen. I don't do nothing dead, nothing at all, not even at the funeral home. I don't fool with it. Not me. Amen. But we serve a living God that is mighty. Amen. And I thank him for that on this morning. Um, Sister Seahorn was up, and she was speaking about vision. Amen. And she was talking about Ruth and Naomi. 
And I absolutely love that story. That's one of my favorite stories um, because for so many reasons. Um, I'm a firm believer that every woman, every young girl um, needs a mentor in their life. They need someone that's not only going to speak to them and tell them, but actually take them by the hand and show them what to do and where to go. And so um, she was speaking about vision, and I'm just who I am, y'all. I'm just joy, and that's me. And so I love who I am, and it's okay with that. I'm okay with that. So I don't have any um, PowerPoints, but hers was good, so can I'm going to piggyback off of hers, so can y'all put it back up there for me? I'm going to roll with it. Is that good with y'all? Is that good with y'all? So can you put it back up there for me? We are talking about this morning. She was talking about vision and having wisdom um, in, in our lives and women with wisdom in our lives. And so today I'm going to speak to you on the importance of a woman with godly vision. Can you guys say that with me? The importance of a woman with godly vision. Wisdom is the ability to view and see your life and the life of others from a God-centered perspective. And it's responding to the things that are going on in your life on the basis of the truth of the word of God. Wisdom, I used to always think I want to be so deep. And I used to pray and pray and pray and pray for wisdom and, and what it was. And, and so I always thought, honestly, in, in me being naive, that wisdom was getting older, having life experiences, going through some different things and, and, and you know, different challenges but, and still coming out alive and in your right mind on the other side. And the Holy Spirit said, well, yeah, but not yeah. What wisdom is, he said, that's knowledge. He says, and there's a lot of people that have knowledge, but they still mess up their lives. He said, wisdom is going through those things, going through those challenges, coming out on the other side, but not just coming out on the other side, but coming out on the other side with a God-centered perspective of what you just went through. Seeing God in what the thing or in the trial that you just suffered through with wisdom or in wisdom should I say is simply vision a godly centered vision vision not going by what you see not going by what you see here in the natural natural but going by what your father sees by what he is speaking to you so you have to ask God for a God-centered vision for your life. I remember um, we're talking about mothers. And mothers, we have a different love. Yes, Charles is very, very um, short with the kids. And it's okay. But I carried them babies. I felt them growing inside of me. I pray for those babies. Um, I Loved Keaton when Keaton's head was this big. Okay? And to see him now, I still love him. So I'm going to have a different type of compassion for him. I'm going to have a different type of love for him. So with vision, I want you to write down these. How many things I got for you real quick? Let me see. Hold on. I want you to write down these four things. The first one is with vision. When you're looking through your, 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 your God-centered eyes, not your natural eyes, vision bursts purpose. Say purpose. Purpose. You have to look within. We need to start by asking the question of ourselves. What am I here for, Lord? Why did you create me? And who am I? It says in one, um, Psalms 139, 13, 14, it says, um, God created me in my inmost being. You know me all together in my mother's womb. I will praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. The great picture of the way that God knows that he has put us together. God is using his God-centered vision at that point. And we need to ask God, God, show me who I am through you. Show me who my kids are through you. Show me who my family is through you. 
Show me who my church is through you. Don't let me get stuck on what I'm seeing right now because if I get stuck on what I'm seeing right now, I'll stop. I believe that was the same way with Naomi and Ruth. See, the, 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 the secret to that story is Ruth thought she needed Naomi, but Naomi needed Ruth just as much because, see, Naomi was ready to give up. She was ready to throw in the towel. She was ready to change her name. Call me Mara. I'm dead. I, there is nothing left in me. And Ruth seen her through God's eyes and said, no, there's still more I need in you. There's still more that I can pull out of you. There's still more that you have to give. And God is saying the same thing to Kansas City Community Church. We looking at it and we don't see it. We ain't feeling it. We like, what is this? God, what are you saying? God said, no, there's still more rain in the clouds. There's still more that you have to give. There's still more souls out there for you to touch. There's still a way for me to come through and it be an example of love and light in this community. And in your homes, he's saying the exact same thing. So the first thing that wisdom gives you, that vision of seeing God, things through God's eyes, is it gives you purpose. It gives you purpose. It also gives you perseverance. Can somebody say perseverance? And Habakkuk 2, 2 through 4, the scripture says, write the vision and make it plain on tablets that he that runs with it and reads it can, can run. I'm sorry. And though the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it will speak and will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it because it will surely come. That's the word of God saying that this road that we are traveling, it will not be easy. It is going to be some bumps on it. It is going to be some ups and downs. But, baby, hold on. Write the vision. Write what God has told you. Write what God has promised you. Because, see, you're going to get hit by some different storms in life. And those storms are going to cause you to lose focus. And when you lose focus, you might not remember who you are. But if you have my promises written down for you to reflect on, for you to go back and say, God, but this is what you said. You will be reminded of his love for you. You will be reminded of who he says you are. And you will be able to persevere through those different storms. And like when you have a child, everything don't go perfect. Naomi was the prime example. What more could she, could she have endured? Ruth was the prime example. I'm going to let y'all know now. I love you, baby. Something happened. I'm good. We ain't doing no do-overs. We're not starting over in 23 years. I'm good. Bless Ruth's heart, because it wouldn't have been me. She had been through some things. But both Naomi and Ruth, God had promised them something. And they promised wasn't adding up to the vision that God had, what they were experiencing. It was not adding up. And God cannot lie. God cannot lie. So if he gave you a promise, you better stand on it. You better reflect on it. You better remind him of it. If your kids are not acting the way that they act, you better talk to them. You better talk. Don't speak to them naturally, but you speak to that vision that God gave them of you. Our, their future depends on us as women with a vision. We can't afford Forward to let the vision die. I'm passionate about it because I love my babies. I love them with everything in me. And so when I see them going contrary to the word of God and contrary to what I know I put in them, I might not say something to Keaton in particularly, or I might not attack Kennedy um, particularly, but I speak to that. And I said, that is not what God promised me. That is not lining up with what the vision of God is. I know what I prayed for. I know God told me but that this little boy was going to be a leader and not a follower. I know that he has favor on his life. I know that he is the head and not the tail. Statistics, yeah, I know what they are, but I'd be dang on if Kennedy is one of them, not this year. 
We got to get some mamas back on the line that are going to speak into their children's life, that are going to speak that vision, that are going to say, no, you not. I'm sorry. Kendi gets so mad at me. I'm like, mm, I don't care. You're not like everybody else up at the school. You, you, you do, Keaton used to get mad. He was like, I'm the only senior, and I got to be in it 12. All my other friends don't have to come in until 2 or 3. I'm like, oh, sucks to be you. You ain't walking in my house at midnight because you're different. I can't let you do. You know why I can't let you do what everybody else do? Let me get you into a secret, buddy, because you don't understand. I'm your mama. That's your daddy. We serving God with all our heart. So if I let you slip, the devil ain't playing with you. He's going to take you out. And that's the mentality. It's not just my kids. It's your kids, your kids, your kids. And I just don't pray that way about my babies. I pray that way about your kids, your kids, your kids. I speak into their lives. You having a bad day? Come chat with me. Because, see, I done been somewhere, and I see something in you that you don't see in yourself. You having a rough time? You can make it. Sometimes that's all they need to hear. Sometimes as mothers, that's all we need to hear. It ain't nothing like a mother with a vision for their child. I'll give you a life experience that just happened on the other day. We, um, I was looking at my sister. We, um, I had a little snafu in my life on Friday. And I didn't want to bother anybody else. <clears throat> so I thought I was being smart, and I really didn't want to involve Charles. So I thought I was being smart, and I called my daughter. And I said, Kennedy, mommy is very sick. I need your help. I just need you to talk to me. You know, walk me through this. Let me, so I can get home. So evidently, I, I guess I really wasn't sounding real right to Kennedy and talking real right to Kennedy. So Kennedy was like, okay, she's talking to me, but I can hear her on another line. And so I'm like, Kennedy, who are you talking to? Mama. I said, yeah, I need you to just pull on over. Don't worry about getting home. Where you at? And I said, well, I'm, I'm by Wendy's. Okay. I need you to pull over. Granny is on her way. Dude, I just told you. I didn't want to get nobody else involved. I wasn't looking. I was not using wisdom. She, exactly. The roles had reversed at that time. She was my Naomi. So the next thing I know, I'm lightheaded. I, I'm really out of it. I do. I pull over to the park, get parked, and I'm sitting there. Next thing I know, my mama and my auntie hop out the car. Like, I'm like, okay. So they get me out the car. Now, my, my mama's older. My auntie just had brain surgery. I'm feeling so bad. I'm feeling so bad. So I get in the car. My auntie, I guess, gets me home. They get some food in me. I get settled. I get my blood sugar back up. And, um, I'm, I'm feeling better. Next morning, I wake up. I said, Kennedy, I said, um, how did my car get home? And she said, Granny drove your car home. I said, oh, my goodness. I said, was she okay in the car? She was like, yes, Mama, Granny was fine. I was like, okay, you sure? She was like, Mama, you want to know the truth? I said, yeah. She said, Granny was dipping in your car. <laughs> and she didn't even come straight home. Go check your gas tank. <laughs> I said, Kenny, don't be lying on my mom. My mom was not dipping in my car. She was like, for real, go check your gas. I was even holding on to the side of the thing. Granny was, <laughs> was Granny was rolling. So I called my mama. I said, Mama, was you? She was like, Yeah, girl. I, was, I said, You wasn't scared? Or, she was like, No, I used to have one of them. She's like, And when they used to pull up to me at the lights and try to race me, I my foolish self, I would race them. I said, that's where I get it from. You try to act so. <laughs> but I said all that to say my mama was like, my baby is not going to, first of all, endanger her life. And secondly, endanger somebody else's life. Wherever she at, I'm going to come get her. And I'm going to see to her getting, her getting home. 
And that's what mothers are, amen? Wherever our babies is at, it don't matter. You call, if I can get there, I am coming. That is that spiritual leadership that we need in our lives. Put everything else aside. Mothers will put our tiredness aside, our weights aside. The Bible says, lay everything else aside. We on our way. We're going to ante up and we coming, amen? Because God is going to give us that perseverance. Because he gave us that vision. What was happening on Friday wasn't lining up with the vision that God gave me, that God gave my mama for me. So she went back to the plan. She was like, no, no, this ain't what the Lord said, so we're going to go ahead and help her out. But it was because she wrote the vision. She was able to go back and persevere. I'm of age. <laughs> Two. No. <laughs> but. I'm of age. She didn't have to do that. But because she's a mother with the vision, she did what she had to do. Amen? And it was the same way with Ruth and Naomi. Ruth had a vision. Ruth said, there was more that I need out of you. Naomi was, say, was saying, I'm done. But Ruth said, there's more that I need. There's more in you, women of God. There's more in you, mother. I know we tired, but there's more in you. And not only do your children need you, I need you. Sister Seahorn needs you. We need you. Amen? So we can keep this going and keep our baton going. Also, vision ensues or promotes or births passion. Can somebody say passion? Your vision or God's vision ignites a love and a compassion a burning desire to please him, a thirst for a true and living God, one that only he can quench. In Jeremiah 20 and 9, it says, If I say I won't mention him or speak any longer in his name, his message, his word, his vision, his message, his word, his vision becomes a fire burning in my heart, shut up in my bones. I become tired of holding it in. I cannot prevail. It becomes your passion, your godly vision for your children, for your life, for what God has shown you becomes your passion. The word of God said it becomes like fire, shut up in your bones. So what Jeremiah was saying is, hey, I'm messed up if I say his name, if I preach his word. I'm messed up if I don't. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to go with the Lord. And that's what a lot of us need to do. Don't just let it burn on the inside of you. Don't just implode with it. Let it come out. Explode in the word of God. Let it soothe out of you. Let it move out of you. Speak his name. Because if you don't, you're going to die in it. You can't let the vision die inside of you. You got to let it out of you. Because it's not just a vision for you and your life. It's for everything and everyone that is attached to you. So allow the vision to come out. It says your passion will feel like a jolt of electricity going through your body. When is the last time you felt like that? When is the last time you felt like a jolt of electricity just going through your body? Anybody got, can anybody recollect that? I encourage y'all to find your passion then. Benjamin Franklin said that. He said, many people die at the age of 25, but they aren't buried until they're 75. Did y'all get the gist of that? So many of us are locked into our work and our lives that we feel like we have no choice but to keep doing what we've always been doing. I'm going to refer back to Ruth and Naomi. Ruth could have stayed in her hometown. She could have stayed there. She was known there. She had it all together. Her family was there. Her support system was there. But 
it was a fire that was shut up in her. And she said, I can't stay here and die. I've got to move forward. So Naomi, thank you for letting me or for giving me the permission to stay home. But I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to ride with you. I encourage you women to get you a Naomi in your life and ride with them. Don't let them drop you off at the corner. Don't let them get, get tired of you. Don't let them get weak. Don't let them get weary in what they're doing. Ride with them all the way. Amen? It says, we start to believe that fulfillment is for other people but not for us. We think that dreams and visions are the things that we grow out of when responsibility takes over. I dare you to dream. I dare you to get a vision in you, a godly vision for your life, not just your life, but for your children's life. I dare you. It's not just for somebody else. It's not just for me. It's not just for the next person. It's for every woman, every man in this room. Can you imagine what Kansas City Community Church would be like if we were all walking in our vision? If we were all on fire, like Jeremiah was on fire, this room would not be able to contain us because he is that awesome and that great. So I want you guys to dare yourself to dream. Ask God to show you and to give you um, his passion and his purpose for your life through his vision. And the last thing that it births, it births forth the promise. In Jeremiah 29 and 11, it says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. Amen? God knows what he's doing in your life. Even though you might not understand it, even though you might not know, God knows because he has your vision for you. He goes back to my first scripture. He knitted you together in his room, in his womb. I'm going to tell everybody a secret about me. I was never one in my family, well, most of them can attest to the fact, I was never the little girl that thought about being married. I didn't practice wedding stuff. I didn't talk about wedding stuff. I don't, I loved kids growing up, but I was never the one that was like, I want a baby. I'm, mm, 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 no. None of that. Y'all really want to know what I want to be? I'm going to let y'all in on a little secret. I really wanted to be a Rick James backup singer. I had goals. I seen him on Soul Train, and I was like, that's me. I want to be a Rick James backup singer. And then after I went through that phase, I wanted to be MC Light. But nowhere in that was wife. Nowhere in that was mother. Nowhere in that was speaking the word of God. But one day, amen, God showed my mother something. And it took me getting beat up and tied to a little stop sign for her to put me in a private school because that was not the vision that the Lord gave my mama for me. So she put me in a private school, and she kept me there. And that word it, it just penetrated. They pounded the word in us, pounded, pounded, pounded the word in us. And that was the beginning. I didn't know it, but that was the beginning of it then. Then time went on, time went on. I think I had a, peti a petition made up for me to get out the private school. I had enough signatures, so I got out of there by the time I was in the eighth grade. Amen. She sent me straight from the private school to Wanda High School. Right, but you got to be ready for Wanda, baby. You can't... <laughs> Come out with Bible scriptures and go straight into wine to high school. I was like, whoa, <laughs> this is a little different. But I transitioned and I progressed and I went on in there and handled my business. Then I ran into a fella at Osco 
grocery store and yeah, yeah, drugstore. I was working. And he came pimping through. He pimped back then. Yes, he did. I was a cashier. He brought some gummy worms, I think it was. I think it was some gummy worms. He got me, got me little gummy worms. And he kind of said, what's up to me? I said, what's up? Went on about my business. Really wasn't my type back then. But God knew. I was more into getting windows, you know, shot out and people going to jail and stuff for no, just the thrill of it, I guess. I don't know. But then he just kept coming back through buying gummy worms. I'm like, look, I know this dude don't eat that much gummy worms, but it's okay. I kept ringing him up. A couple of weeks went by, and I think I seen him at a concert. We kind of made eye contact. Bell Bib DeVoe, we're aging, we're, I'm aging ourselves. We was jamming. He pimped through a little Kemper Arena back then. So how you doing? So then my sister goes to a church. She comes home. She was like, Joy. I said, what? I wasn't right. I was probably just waking up or something. She's like, it's a, it was a guy at the church that I went to today. He played the drums. And I seen him. And I said, oh, he might be nice for my sister. Mind you, my sister was such a stickler. I hated for people to call my house for me because she would be so rude to them. She would hang up on them, just I'm like, who are you? How old are you? What are you doing? What are you doing? Click. So for her to say something, I'm like, oh, okay, cool. She was like, but the only thing I didn't like about him is that he walked in church super late, and then he pimped up to the drums. I was like, oh, no, nah, I'm good on that. I'm good on that. Time changed. Time went on. Time went on. I don't know how we reconnected, but we ended up reconnecting. Ended up falling in love with each other. And he asked me to marry him. So I said, okay, but on conditions. I will marry you because I knew, you know, I wasn't stupid. I was born in, in the word and I was raised up in the word even though I wasn't acting right. So I knew his background, I knew where he came from. So I said, it's only on conditions that I marry you. I will marry you if you promise that you won't be like your daddy and your uncles. That you won't preach. I don't even want you to be a minister. And, I mean, we can have kids and stuff, but and we can raise them. We can sit on a pew, but I don't want to do nothing else. We can just bring them to church every Sunday. And as long as you promise, we can still cuss. That was my, that was my, hey, those were my conditions. I promise y'all. He said, what did you say, Charles? <laughs> yeah, I said, we married, so he must have said, okay. No sooner than we get married, get down the aisle. We go to one church service. <laughs> one. <laughs> this dude come back to the house, Joy. I said, yeah. I think the Lord is calling me. <laughs> calling you where? <laughs> calling me to the ministry. Ministry for what? Because in my head, I was like, now see, you promised me that we could still cuss, that we wouldn't go to church, and I was supposed to be the Rick James backup singer. And MC Light, I even got my nose pierced and my mama made me take it out. But God seen something in me. God seen today. God seen my children. God seen my children and they didn't need no Rick James backup singer for a mama. They needed someone that was going to speak into their lives. And so I'm telling you, it doesn't matter what your vision is. I know you have an idea of what you think you might want to do. But your idea, as you can see with my idea, is so far removed from the beautiful plan God has for your life. And I thank him for that. I thank him for his plan. I thank him that all my goals and all my um, 
my, my little victories I thought I was going to have, they all just fell to nothing. I thank him for that, that he released me from those things, and he gave me his wonderful life. I could not ask for a better life. It's not because I'm married to Charles. I appreciate him, and I love him. He was just a tool that God used. It's not because I'm the mother of two beautiful children. I love them with every fiber of my being. But everything that I am today, everything that I hope to be in the future, it's because of God. The word of God, and I, this is it, and I'm going to close. This is my favorite scripture, and I stand on it. Y'all read it if you get a chance. It's 1 John 3 and 2, and it says, Beloved, now we are children of God. And this is my part, y'all, right here. And it has not yet appeared what we will be. You don't see what you're going to be. That's why the devil's fighting you so hard. That's why he fought me so hard with depression, with heartache, with pain, trying to get me to just take your own life. It don't matter. God said, baby, you don't see what you're going to be. He's seen it. He put it in me. He gave me a glimpse of it. And once I got a glimpse of it, it was like Jeremiah in that word. I said, I got to get up from here. God has too much for me. And he has too much for you in store. See yourself as God sees you. See others as God sees them. Be patient with them. Move with compassion. Move with love. And remind yourself when you're going through trials and tribulations, get in that mirror, lovely ladies, as we love to do, and say 1 John 3 and 2, it hath not appeared yet what I shall be. Amen.